Hi everyone, welcome to our ninth in the series of 10 free talks to get your craft business ready for the digital and physical opportunities of 2021 and beyond. These talks have been created by the Crafts Council and funded by Crafting Europe. We have Ukrainian interpretation available for those that need it. And just to say, we are recording this talk and this will be made available on our YouTube channel, Crafts Council, next week. Please note that we've got a Q&A function. So any questions that you might have during this talk, please place them there. Before I welcome our guest, Adula Nafisi, I will share some insights into what the experience economy could mean for you. For those of you who have watched previous talks, I normally set the context of the theme of the talk in relation to the craft business before we hear from our guests, but I will be doing quite a bit of the talk this today. So, this is our little agenda. First of all, what is an experience? Then I'll set the context of the craft experiences in relation to your own craft business. Then how do experiences feed into the economy? Then how do experiences shape and inform your business model? How to make experiences happen? And then we will be hearing from Adilla. Following that, we will have our Q&A. So starting us off. What is the experience economy? It is by definition an event or occurrence which leaves an impression on someone. I want you to refer to Welcome to the Experience Economy by B. Joseph Pine II and James H. Gilmore from Harvard Business School. They describe how economics change by using the reference of a birthday cake demonstration demonstrating the progression of economic value when you go through the stages. First, a mother creating a birthday cake from basic ingredients. Then second, a parent buying into pre-prepared ingredients from a retail brand. Then third, a parent commissioning a local baker or cake maker to produce the birthday cake. And now even more so, people are outsourcing birthday events to a event organizer. So in the words of B. Joseph Pine II and James H. Gilmore, an experience is not an amorphous construct. It is a real offering as any service, good or commodity they are designed to command a fee. So why the importance of growing experience economy for your craft business? The why, the rationale. Why consider experiences as a part of your craft business? Soon we'll be sharing the different rationales behind why experiences matter to makers and how they apply them to their business objectives. What I want you to think about here is what do you consider as an experience? And no, this does not have to be a craft experience. I want you to think about how did this experience make you feel? What were the motivations for taking part? What was the fee that you paid? Were there any unexpected outcomes? For those of you who already offer experiences such as workshops, have you designed this as a part of your business objectives or do you offer experiences on an ad hoc basis? So research, if craft experiences are something you consider as an important viable option for your business, Add this to your regular schedule of research. We recommend not only looking after craft businesses for inspiration, but looking at other sectors also. For example, 
much of the farming sector is diversifying the use of their land. Some of this is through experiences. There are opportunities here potentially to partner up or collaborate with them. Start with research to build your awareness, scope out opportunities, potential connections and build ideas. Then you can move on to the marketing. So once you've worked out the experiences you want to offer, think about how you can reach that target audience. Not sure where to start? Think about what uh, those that have already shown interest in your work. Reach out to them. Also worth looking at the Crafts Council Market for Craft data tool. This can help you identify types of audiences interested in experiences you may have to offer. Once you have your target audience, the next step is clear, concise, visual and written communication. Whether you're reaching out through newsletters, direct emails or social, is your website ready to provide backup information and a shop options for easy, straightforward purchasing? Structure. You do need logistics in place for your experiences. For example, if you are offering workshops, you do need to design a lesson plan. This is to ensure participants go away satisfied that they have achieved what you have advertised they would achieve. We will go into more details later on logistics, but it is important to factor in time for setting up the experiences and budgeting for investing into your experience offers properly. The planning. Allow time for planning. A great way to ensure you have enough time is to plan backwards from your deadline. This is where research is the key. You cannot plan without data. Therefore, the more you know, the more you can create a realistic plan. Connections. Once you have your target audience identified, plan your marketing campaign. This should include realistic time frame for all elements such as sending a press release three months in advance to say a regional publication to paid social ads say two to three weeks in advance and all of those elements in between. Once you have planned before you launch ask yourself does your messaging inspire people to connect? Not sure? Ask for others for feedback. This could be your friends or family or fellow makers. Ask them, is your campaign clear? Even ask them to test out the buying options on your website. Finally, the future. Experiences could become a part of your main income stream. If you have not hosted them before, it's worth creating pilot projects. Remember though, always review the outcome so you can improve on future offers. An idea worth considering is offering your first few experiences at a subsidized offer with the caveat that you're asking people for honest feedback so that you can review, adjust and replan. Also highlight whether you decide their experiences are a viable option for your business or not. Either way, setting short and long-term goals are essential to making your business work. So how do experiences feed into the economy? The Crafts Council Market for Craft report in 2020 demonstrated the growth of the experience economy. Since our last report in 2010, craft has become mainstream. This has been achieved by the growth of craft fairs, where new intermediaries bring buyers together with makers. And they have deployed retail and merchandising principles of craft. The focus is not only on positioning craft as a high quality competitor to art, design and fashion, but also on building brands through supporting makers with concept development, market focus, and making work more collectible at the right price. 
New intermediaries such as Udomo provide makers with an opportunity to build sustainable craft businesses through diversification into craft experiences. Tapping into the continuing and thriving experience economy. The population survey identified an ongoing appetite for paid craft experiences with 20% of the overall market for craft, indicating that they would pay to attend a craft workshop in the future. As well as offering active craft experiences, some makers were constrained by time and workshop space to offer courses. The solution is to diversify a behind the scenes offer. This could be a hands-on tour. This interest is, is going behind the scenes and understanding the creative process is a phenomenon where we observed elsewhere amongst museum visitors who want to understand conservation processes or how curators and designers approach selecting and displaying objects in exhibitions. A good example of this is London Craft Week. Launched in 2015, it is described as an accessible and immersive cultural experience where London Craft Week's visitors get to eat, drink and view performances, meet artists, designers and makers and engineers, get a glimpse into the behind the scenes of famous brands and landmark buildings, see familiar products deconstructed, learn how things are made and even have a go themselves. Another example of the growing experience economy is Airbnb. In 2016, the company launched the experience feature on their Airbnb app. This feature allows hosts to offer tours and events in addition to places to stay. Since its inception, this has grown to an Airbnb's host creating their own holiday adventures competing with tour companies, and there is even scope for online Airbnb experiences. A common trend is seeing many sectors come together to offer experiences that enhance their brand, such as dining experiences are now transformed by designers, and makers are enhancing chefs' creations and narration through exceptional crafted collaborations. So I want you to think about ways in which the craft experience might provide a route for you as a maker to develop your business model, generate an additional income stream, engage audiences to feed into your research, provide access to education, provide added value and profile to your brand. So how can experiences shape and inform your business model? We're going to introduce you to varying types of business models. Participatory. A really good example of this is the Festival of Making in Blackburn. This was set up in 2017 to invigorate the community into value of making and manufacturing by offering experiences in these areas. Festivals play a big role in the experience economy. Each may have their own unique selling point. However, creative participation is at their heart. A further example is the Wildhood Festival in Edinburgh. This one really focuses on educational access to creativity for families. Social enterprise. A good example is Udomo where the business objective is to provide craft kits and access to workshops, whether in person or online, to provide a well-being creative experience. Commercial, for example, facilities provision. A good example is Turning Earth based in London, a studio and facilities provider for ceramicists. Or more broadly, the Biscuit Factory in Newcastle upon Tyne offering a venue for hire, studio space, cafe and shop, as well as exhibitions. Where there is a crossover model between commercial and social enterprise, an example would be Oka Print Studio. They provide an open access and membership 
and training facility for creatives, but also support vulnerable adults. To teach as a business model. A great example of this is our designers whose work can challenge preconceived perceptions. Take Lesik Skian, a blacksmith producing high quality knives in Suffolk. He offers experience of knife making workshops. This provides an income stream and long term potential buyers for his products. For well being, this could be aiming at specific targeted groups, where groups or individuals are looking for an activity to come together, to learn a new skill, or to enhance their well-being. Ruth Wheeler provides a good example of an experience model that prim primarily involves teaching. Here, Ruth combines all of her skills as a maker, a yoga instructor, and a facilitator of community engaged workshops for disadvantaged people and young people to shape her business. She offers regular well being days or weekends as her main income stream. Could you collaborate with another business, such as a yoga instructor or a local farm offering tools? Combining your efforts creates a great USP package. On to subscriptions. This could offer a good regular income stream for your business. NAC, that is K-N-A-C-K, is a great example of a business built on subscription. They, where people can buy a monthly subscription, a gift subscription, or a one-off box. This model is based around experiences in your homes where materials and tutorials are provided for you. A maker who has diversified her business to offer subscription is puppet sculptor Laura Matthews. She makes full use of the platform Patreon. She has built up her Instagram following by engaging video content that has inspired people to subscribe to exclusive offers. These offers are experiences, whether buying into a puppet kit or insight into her creative processes. Finally, memberships. Many mem uh, makers look to open access member offers as a way to build a community and gain critical feedback about their work, as well as feel connected to local peers. Examples of memberships could be studio provision through open access membership, where they could have had tiered membership of more open access than others to suit the individual needs. Ceramic studios like the Kiln Rooms in London or print studios like East London Printmakers enable their members to create experiences to audiences, most commonly known are the open studio events. In addition to these, I also wanted to highlight where the business model are organisations that enable you to have the infrastructure to provide your own experiences. And I'm talking about open studio events and the big draw is another example. So open studio events are in themselves a business. They provide an accessible platform for all artists and makers to provide an accessible experience for art enthusiasts. Artists at Home, based in Hammersmith, established in 73, is the oldest ever established event in the annual open studio calendar. They can be county-wide, building-based, or a part of a bigger festival, like Spring Fling in Dumfries and Galloway. The Big Draw is a big national campaign that is set up in 2000 to promote the universal language of drawing as a learning tool, expression, and intention, invention. This is where a lot of artists and makers can sign up to that campaign and offer their own experiences. So how can you make experiences happen? Following the context that I set earlier, I'm going to go into more detail of how you can make experiences happen. Firstly, what are your objectives? What do you want to achieve by hosting experiences? 
Be honest with yourself here. Perhaps there are objectives you have in mind for your business growth, but have not considered as an experience. Two ideas spring to mind. Offering experiences to feed into your research, such as a PhD, or using experiences to be a part of a bigger marketing campaign. Identifying your brand values. This is really important and please refer to our first spring back talk on how to identify your brand values. This will really help. If you have identified brand values, for example, they could be well-being, creativity, collaboration and participation. Ruth Wheeler's business model would fulfill these values really well. Values help give you direction. They help others to understand your business objectives and help you to align with others with similar values. This is particularly important if you are applying for an opportunity or scoping out opportunities for collaboration. So experiences as a brand value. Many corporate or retail brands have always looked to providing added value to their brand. A classic example is Virgin, where you can buy into experiences under the Virgin name, such as Virgin Balloon Rides. In the case of Craft, I'm highlighting companies who work with artists, makers, and designers to enhance their brand. They, these offers open up opportunities or paid for opportunities or brand association, raising your profile. Brookfield property developers operate real estate investments on behalf of Brookfield Asset Management, or one of the largest alternative asset managers in the world. They are really keen to support the local environment that they develop in. And they do this by delivering experiences that are exciting, inspiring, extraordinary. This is really important to their brand values. And they are working very closely with the mayors, the Lord Mayor of London, that is, enhancing the city programme, the Cultural Mile. Mm. So where are the opportunities? I referred to this earlier, where are the opportunities for you to offer experiences? Is this through your own studio space or to hire a venue, to partner with another business or to design experiences that could be commissioned by others? A good example of this is Karen Thompson, who offers creative educational experiences in museum and festival settings. Look to your local networks Look online listings such as Crafts Council Facebook Opportunities page, or look to bigger events such as The Big Draw or Open Studios. But most importantly, look to the opportunities within your own business plan. Where can you scope out financial growth and sustained income streams? Set a plan, so important to create a plan. That is smart. And that means specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. To help you achieve this, set a deadline and plan backwards. By doing this, you can work out what you can achieve within the time frame, and work out if it's realistic. If it's not, can you extend your deadline? If that's not possible, can you adapt your plan to be more achievable? The Crafts Council have a free year planner on our business resources page that can help you out. Identify the logistics. These are the things to have in place to protect you and your business and those that access your experiences. Earlier I mentioned lesson planning, really important whether, you offer, uh, whether your offer is achievable within the allocated timeframe that you have set. These plans 
can also help you work out how much space you need, the materials you need, any equipment that is needed. But remember also, when planning out time, you work much quicker than those that are new to your craft. Other things to factor in here are public liability insurance, to do a risk assessment, to provide a health and safety policy, to provide terms and conditions. And this needs to include cancellation and refund policies. This is particularly important for managing bookings. You don't want somebody to drop out really last minute and you have to issue a full refund and yet you've hired a space, paid for that space and paid for all of the materials. So really think about those terms and conditions. Identify pricing structure. This does require quite a lot of thought and planning in various scenarios. For example, if you have an experience, let's take creating Christmas decorations. How many people can you accommodate in your space? How long will this experience take? That's obviously where your lesson planning comes in. And what are you providing as a part of this experience? Space, could it be the materials? Could it also be refreshments? What are you offering? So things to consider when you're working out your pricing are the materials, a percentage of your overheads, the time it takes to deliver the session as well as prepare for the session, and a percentage of your administration time. This will give you a basic figure of an overall cost. Let's take, for example, £250. Research into similar offers. What are the prices that are out there for a similar offer with a similar time frame? Let's take, for example, it's £90. So for you to have a profit made on this experience, you need a minimum of three people. If your space can only accommodate two, then you're not going to earn a profit. So then it needs to be a little bit of an adjustment. So there's two things you could do here with that adjustment. Could you adapt your offer and potentially do a, a day spent that you could charge more for? Or could you collaborate with somebody else in a bigger space to accommodate more people and therefore potentially earn more that way? Or hire a venue? Think about how you can adapt your offers, but this is where planning is really, really important and investing in time to figure out what is your pricing structure. To marketing your experience. Communication is the key, both written and visual. To start, make sure you have identified the, what people can expect. Once you have this, then you can get going. What are the communications channels you have on offer? For example, website, local press, social media, newsletter, direct messaging. Each of these channels require an individual plan, but where you bring them together is that consistent messaging. I mentioned earlier the idea of inviting people you know to attend your experience at a subsidized rate, with the caveat that they provide you with feedback. There is also scope here to ask them to be a part of the documentation of the space. So film and photography, um, so you, that you can gather all important visuals that inspire others to purchase your future experiences. Finally, the deliver and review. Once you have your plan in place, people have signed up and now you can deliver. Make notes on what adaptations you would make to improve on your experience. Always welcome and encourage feedback. This will help provide testimonials, as well as a chance to review and refresh your offers. In the process of reviewing, always remember why you are offering experiences in the first instance. Adjust and replan. I really think this speaks for itself. So what I'm going to do now is stop sharing my screen 
and hand over to Dylan Vesey to come and join me on the screen to share his insight on offering experiences through his business. Over to you, Dylan. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I learned quite a lot. Um, it was a very well structured talk. Well, hello everyone. My name is Abdullah Nafisi. I'm right now sitting in Nafisi studio, which Kate and I, my wife um, and I, we built this place together. Well, I want to tell you the story of what we do in Nafisi studio and how we came about experiencing the experience economy. Before that, I need to give you a little introduction about time. Well, time, the way that we experience time has a lot changed through the past in comparison to the past. Well, in the past, there was three airports around the world and that was the choice of traveling to three, four, five countries. Today, we sit in our homes and we decide which country we want to spend for our holiday. And yes, we understand the COVID time. This is a general talk. Now, that leads me to a realization, although we are living in the time that we call it contemporary, and contemporary artists we as we are, we are in the globalization time. What does that mean? That means the choices, okay? Choices, there are plenty of choices. You can have one experience, but you can experience that one experience through too many different ways and forms. Well, there are lots of experience about, um, examples around that. Like for example, a woodworking course, you can have it in a workshop. You can have it in a forest. You can go foraging and then go into a green woodworking course. You can use your, go come to a course that you can use your off cuts and cook your meals with it at the end of the course. So you see, there's one experience, but you can present it to so many different ways. Going back to time, in the past, we used to spend a lot of time to create something, to make something, and that would consume plenty of our time. But today, we order our food to our home. Today, we don't need to go shopping anymore. We, and we just, it's a click. And we all know the jazz of speed of life that has brought us a lot of time in our hand. But yet, you are saying, well, Abdullah and Fisi, I don't have time. Well, I'm going to tell you, yes, we don't have time much in our hand, but that's a very interesting question that took Kate and I quite a long time to answer it. And we don't have time because our expectation of life has changed, okay? Our expectation of life has changed. We are hearing the word life expectancy more. What does that mean? What does that mean? The past people were not necessarily talking about like expectancy. It's because what we can experience within that length of time. So technology has enabled us to do more, to experience more, to, to, to be part of other people's story, to hear other people's stories and increase the narrative of our life. In the COVID time, we all realize one thing. Having a Rolex doesn't make you happy. But being part of a community, being doing something that will add to your experience so you can share that with the new community that you have and hopefully they can use from that and you guys could do something upon it and build something on that basis. That makes you excited. You wanna do more. And that effectively is happiness, okay? So I'm adding happiness, there was time, okay? So, what am I going with this? This is basically the fundamental of our philosophy in our studio. Us as craft people and artists, we don't really have much time, okay? 
and the facilities around us. But one thing we should realize about ourselves is the things that we take for granted, but others would like to experience that, okay? So it was about six years ago that Kate and I came to a realization that if Kate is the art director of the studio and I'm the living artist in the studio, is that we came to a realization that if we want to be not dictated by the clients, what the direction of our studio, then we need to have a separate income, okay? Because I started realizing that in order to make a sculptures, I have to do so many jobs that was taking, drifting me away from what, was, what I was doing, okay? Now, this is a problem. How can I make my art and at the same time can afford my art? I'm sure that most of you have that pain in your heart. Okay, we realized that by a research, thanks to Kate coming from tech background, by a research that giant companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, um, these are the not numbers, big companies that you know, but there are much smaller companies that also have budgets for their staff to go and experience something. That could be making a, I don't know, a Chinese food altogether. Like 10 people making a Chinese food together. And that would make a day. But what was the budget for that day? 1,000 pounds. Okay, 100 pounds per head. <clears throat> well, that's sweet. Because if we could bring that one day to our studio, two or three days of it, that would find the studio. So we started reaching out. We started curating um, some photos and we put them all together in a nice format, um, acceptable format. We started preaching to those companies and yes, we got a thumbs up from Facebook. Wow, we were dancing in the middle of the studio. So Facebook is coming here, right? 15 people in a day they sent to our studio. We had no idea what to do with 15 people in the studio. We didn't have this part of the studio. It was much smaller. So what did we do? We took, put top holding outside and they said like, I don't know, let's just roll with this time. It was very stressful. Long story short, people came, had an amazing experience and they left. And sling, 1500 pounds into the account. Well, that was good. Yes, it was not as simple. Two days preparation, one day is just, um, uh, just clearing the mess up, but that wasn't bad. It was a good start. What we were doing, we were selling our expertise for very small efforts, but high reward. That was a high number. We reduced the number to eight people and we could and arrange, manage eight people very well. And that led into courses after courses after courses. It was a fixed course, about two courses a month. And so that, we, so that we could focus on the art projects on the other side. And what was very interesting with an observation, we, so this observation word is very key in experience economy because you're constantly observing the customer behavior, the user experience. What is it that they like? We were running steam bending courses and people all loved the half a circle shape, lamp they wanted to make. Maybe that's the way forward. Let's make all those 10, 12 products that we had designed into one product. So that observation led us to have less effort to produce a better product. And therefore now, Westin, a couple of years ago, Westin College started approaching us, Newberry Arts started approaching us, and now we are um, a regular teachers in, um, in Westin College, and the courses are booked, and there is a long queue for them. Why is that? It's because that observation of that experience that we had through so many, many, many times that we had all those courses, and we started looking at what is it that people like more and they were telling us and that was making my life, my life much much more easier right so we got the courses now right but that's not the end of it 
remember I told you the things that we take for granted that we know in ourselves and we think that, well, why would anybody be interested in that? Guys, we were hearing things during these courses that some people were saying that I don't care if I walk out of this course without any product. I just want to be here. I just want to see what you guys do. Oh, really? You pay? You just paid 150 pounds for it. You don't want to have anything? I said, no, no, no. I actually want to just see. I want to experience this. And there we didn't know the word experience economy. And we were literally doing experience economy. The people were coming experiencing what we do. So that was interesting. So I started looking at, we started adding another section into our website, come and experience the business with us. And believe it or not, people came for seven hours a day, just looking at what I do. Literally what I do. I didn't even have to do anything. They were observing what I do and asking me questions. So why did you do that? Well, I do this because of this. And why do you use this machine? Well, I, it's because I needed this machine from that. Where can I buy it from? So they were coming and, and really in one day paying, yes, one-to-one -one course, 500 pounds. I am giving you the numbers because I have to, to, for you to know that the value of things that you don't realize could be in a day doing just what you do, providing people with that information. Now, I look back and think, building my workshop took me years of research. And that person came, 500 pounds, took it all away. And that they can, now they can create their own workshop based on what I have curated around me. Well, that's actually a good deal for them. I never knew that myself. So that's not bad, right? So I think that you've got the idea of don't take your knowledge and what you do, your space, no matter how small that is, this, this building that you see was, was not there when I was running those courses. People didn't give a care. They did not care about, about my workshop. They just wanted to experience that steam bending machine, which was quite a simple experience. Right. Moving on from this, talks. I started being asked um, from different organizations, can you give a talk based on this? Can you give a talk based on that? And it was quite stressful. The first talks were actually quite, I was just hanging up the course. So like, oh my God, I hate myself. What did I just do? What did I just say? What was going on? But the first few always, always is a disaster and starts, you build on the top of it. you trust yourself more, you trust your knowledge more. Samurais say you only fall down to the level of your own experience. So what, what, what's to be afraid of? Get out there, talk to your friends, talk to your fellow craft people and share the knowledge that you know. Even if it's one, one small topic that is important to you, reach out. Even Craft Council is a big supporter of me. And every time that I've reached out, they had, they had a response to me. Um, a way, a, a suggestion. So there are people that you can reach out to me, that you can reach out to fellow crafts people, and you can create a talk for yourself. Right. And another thing that is actually very interesting is that Kate and I have a very, very simple lifestyle, and that is our philosophy. Our philosophy is live very, very, very small, very, very simple. So our home is hardly livable for any of you guys. It's very, very tiny. It's a bed. It's a very small kitchen and a, and a loo, right? But we believe that we spend about 70% of our active time, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in our workshop. So we invest everything in our workshop. There is a shepherd's hut next to our workshop. We spend most of our evenings in there. However, we started realizing that there is a company called Wawa and vaca vaca Vacation Away with Artists. And there are people who want to come in your home, in your studio, and they're happy to take a hotel and or live in your shepherd's hut for a week and pay you a good amount of money, just be around you. 
And that's another experience. They just want to experience that. They remember about, about the time that they have fast forward their business, their time and whatever their, their financial, now they have time available within the time of their life. They want to experience with different artists in your studio, in my studio. So that's another, um, that's another spark out in the sky. And another bioproduct that came out of our studio, which we are very excited about is podcasts. Well, you know, you know better than I do that we spend all of our time in our studio. It's these walls are our temple and hardly we get time to go out there to parties and meet people or um, talks and conferences. And how can, we, how can we hear and get their experience, bring their experience to our business? And for us, it was podcast. We started the podcast and started inviting very pe people that we would hardly even normally see in, nor in normal life. But because it was a podcast, for some reason, they accepted our invitation and they came to our studio and they started sharing their knowledge and the roadmap of their, of their experience in our podcast. Well, the, it's called Data and Craft. Soon we will be um, publishing, um, we're going to be launching the podcast with Craft Council um, in October. Um, but that's not the point. The name of the podcast here is the experience of how you can in, create an engagement with the environment around you. You can have a very simple microphone and invite people, have a conversation, have a topic. What is it that you're genuinely interested about? I am interested about strategy. I love to know how people work their strategy through their artistic career. And I am also interested about knowing that in all the different sectors, for example, in tech sector, how do people uh, name themselves? They all call themselves crafts, craftsmen. And, and we started in interviewing them and bringing all those experiences into our, uh, into our table and very excited to share with you those. So that's another byproduct of an effortless work in our studio. We were automatically interested to meet people and learn from them. So, but we, we just decided, why don't we just record it? If you record it and that turns into a content and then we can share it and hopefully one day Rolls-Royce want to come and have an advert in the middle of it. Fingers crossed everyone. Right. So that's another buyer product of our studio that we are trying to do it effortlessly. TikTok and Instagram are the other ones. Instagram is very saturated. We all know that. And um, we try to use the platform as much as we can, but TikTok is an interesting one because they pay you for your content. So I started TikTok um, not telling any of my followers and friends that I have started the TikTok purely because I wanted to see what is it that work with people in general. Um, in general. And so I started posting two to three videos a day on the works that I have done on so random different topics. None of it was very beautiful. And believe it or not, I started gaining a very big following. Some of my videos hit 3 million, 5 million, 12 million, 13 million views for something that I just threw at night and I woke up in the morning and see that there is, I don't know, 30 pounds of being paid for, for just testing a product. So that's an interesting one. I highly suggest be the content creator, not the user of the pl platform. So it's important that you post generate, not be the consumer, right? So that's a very important thing to remember as artists, as craftspeople, that we don't want to be spending our time on the platforms because there are thousands of clever people design that platform for us to sit there and not create our craft in the way at the result. But you can have your camera and record what you do and post it on the platform. First of all, you get a very interesting review. You can be relevant to your time and get very interesting uh, user experience and hopefully get paid for it. So 
these are the points that I try to make on how we use the byproduct of what we do in, as user uh, as um, experience economy. Okay, so going back to time, uh, to wrap up my talk, today, the perception of time has changed. People want to experience things, not don't want to buy the Rolex. They are happy to pay 200 pounds to, to see how to make a soap rather than paying a pound to buy the soap. Thank you very much. What a brilliant way to wrap up your talk. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you very That's much. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm going to invite Tanvi onto the screen because I think we've got some questions. Over to you, Tanvi. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, generosity with your insights. That was brilliant. Um, so we've got a question about your podcasts. I know that it's there's some time still for them to come because you mentioned October. Uh, but they um, wanted to know the name of the podcast so they could look out for it. Sure. Um, first of all, I encourage you to follow us on Nafisi Studio on Instagram. It's N-A-F-I-S-I -S -I Studio on Instagram. We will, um, we will share with you the date of the launch. Also, I hope that's also Craft Council will um, share that as well because they have kindly really supported us um, through this uh, through this through this the journey of this podcast and um, so both of these platforms you will know when they will get launched but the idea is that we will um, have it launched um, in craft week and it's called data and craft and the reason for data and and craft is again it goes back to the point that i said we're living in the time of globalization and how data and technology has fast forwarded our life and also there is a euphemism there because there are lots of craftspeople in the world of data and technology that they are basically this, this interface that we are looking at right now there are colors there are buttons somebody has sat down and crafted these and that's really the same mindset that we use when we when we make make an art piece. So I'm bringing also those people in and talking about their craft and then hopefully that diversity will add a lot of info and value. Brilliant, thank you. That sounds exciting. Um, we've just had another one come through. Uh, have you got any advice on managing your time? So, the, so in specifically the ratio between creating the work itself and creating the content example is social media to promote it it's a super good question super good question well first of all managing your time is an everyday challenge it's a sword that you take every morning i want to manage my time i want to hit onto that mail sometimes it's full moon and <laughs> we all go confused <laughs> we might not but it's first of all it's important to be easy on yourself not too hard on yourself. Don't, um, don't, um, yeah, don't be hard on yourself. That's the main thing because it takes time. So how do I manage my time? My idea is that I get up 4.30 every morning, which ends up being 5.30, 6 a.m. in every morning. So I, the aim is 4.30, I get up 5.30, 6 a.m. I do about two hours of, uh, of personal work in the morning and um, try to lay out my Instagram, see what is it that I wanna do, a bit of writing. And then I have, uh, and then self-education about two hours. Um, I don't know, it's about right now, I'm, I'm doing uh, uh, a course on contemporary art and also um, contemporary art of America. And at the same time, I'm doing this uh, with, um, with Christie's Auction House, uh, a language of contemporary art. So that takes me about four hours in the morning before I've started my day, um, cook breakfast my wife, for myself and my wife, and then um, really try to have a plan before I go to sleep the night before, to have an idea about it. It's really, from, I'm not a, 
a spreadsheet guy. I can't bring everything onto a spreadsheet yet. I'm working on it. And um, so before going to sleep, I think, what is it that I want to do tomorrow? How am I going to, what are the main things that if I don't do, I'll get stressed the day, the day after. So, and then I prioritize the main things I want to do and try to do those first. And then the rest is the creative time that um, hopefully I can um, input into the business. Sometimes um, I just see really three days of the week are the real execution time for creative work. And the rest of it is really the prep and admin. Um, enjoy the process. This is the most important thing that you must do. See how can you set up your format and your process in a way that you enjoy it. You really enjoy it and try to do it and doing it effortlessly. That's so important. Do it in a way that you do it effortlessly. You mentioned content in social media, if, if I'm understood correctly. Um, that's another way. Set up your space in a way that when you turn around your camera, it's, if you can, you, you don't have much time, you don't have to spend much time to take that picture. So you've already a little bit laid everything out. Yes, today it's all about the white backgrounds and the way that we do it, we use a lot of blinds in our studio. I don't want to get up and just bring all the blinds down, but there are lots of blinds. It's quite affordable, you know, you, you, you invest 30 pounds on a blind and you just bring it down takes all the rubbish out of the line and you've got a lovely background and you can immediately effortlessly make your content. Really try to be friend with your camera. Today it's about sharing and this is not, this is not your enemy. Remember what I said, don't be the consumer, that is your enemy. Don't be the consumer, be the content creator and say, okay, these are two different people. I am the content creator and there is a person who wants to consume and we are friends, okay? But I am the content creator, so I am going to be friend with my camera. I have my, personally, I have my camera always in my backpack. So no matter what I do, I try to take pictures of things that I find them interesting towards my process. And one last point that I want to say, make a very good um, file organization of your photos and your videos and name them very well, okay? How do you do that? You think that, okay, this is how I'm going to, for example, I wanna lay out my Instagram. So I, how do I lay out my Instagram? There are um, photos with hands at the moment, and I have a file with photos with hands. Everything that is photos with hands. And there are, I love to talk about nature because I believe it's a very important part of our life and I like to talk about it. So there is a file about nature and there is a file about my past work and there is a file about the culture of the past, that photography. So you try, so when I opened my laptop in the past, I had to go through thousands of images and I would, I would just close it down. So like, okay, that's it, half an hour, I don't know what I've done. But now I look into those files, names, everything, in place and there are very and it's actually makes it a very enjoyable process so enjoy the process yeah. Yeah. what you've just said is a, a man not to my own heart i always say that file your images properly and <laughs> label them properly <laughs> make your life easier um i think we've we've come to the end of our time unfortunately to take any more questions Abdullah, thank you so much for your time. Very apt to, uh, to end on that note. Um, and thank you for Crafting Europe for funding these talks. We have one more talk left. This is about other income streams and that is on the 8th of September at one o'clock. If you haven't got your ticket yet, do book that. Um, so all I can say is thank you for watching everyone. And we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.